Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felden, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Felden. Okay, good to see everybody in, and I guess this is the fourth program ready this afternoon. And again, for those of you joining us on television, we uh, always like to thank you for your letters and your prayers. And for those of you who want to get a tape or a book of the program, I think we've been mentioning it, look for the book number. We are now in book number 46, and uh, we're in the fourth program this afternoon. It's the third two hours, so we're finishing book 46 today, huh? So anyway, if you uh, just check the numbers on the board, if you decide to order one of the programs, the tape or whatever, and uh, we'll get them right out to you. Again, uh, I guess uh, I don't like to make announcements because every once in a while somebody will say, don't waste even a half a minute. So we're going to go right back into the book and uh, buy up the time. Hebrews chapter 2, still in verse 3. Hopefully we'll finish it this half hour. But remember where we just left, uh, left off in our last program, we were speaking of this great plan of salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord himself. And you remember in the last program, it took you all the way back to when God confronted Satan or Lucifer and how that he then turned to the Abrahamic covenant and brought everything up through the nation of Israel to bring about the coming of the Messiah and the Redeemer. Then, of course, through Israel's unbelief and rejection, Christ was crucified. And then we move it on up to the Apostle Paul. All right, now I'm going to take you back to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7, where Stephen now, who in consort with Peter and the other eleven there at Jerusalem. Now Stephen approaches the religious leaders of Israel in Acts chapter 7, and the whole idea is the same as what Peter has been trying to do, is to convince the nation of Israel that the one they crucified was the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God and that through faith in him, they could still have him as their king, and he would bring in the kingdom. So now in Acts chapter 7, we find in verse 1, to get the idea of where this is being preached or taught, whatever you want to say, in Acts chapter 7, verse 1, <clears throat> then the high priest said, Are these things so? In other words, what Stephen had been saying even up in chapter 6. Now look at verse 2. So we get to whom was this spoken. And Stephen said, Men, brethren, and fathers, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham. Now that doesn't include a Gentile. Stephen is speaking to the whole nation, but in particular to the religious leaders. And so he said, the God of glory appeared unto our Father. And he brings them all the way up through Israel's history, how that Joseph was not recognized the first time the brethren went down for grain. But when he went the second time, then they understood who Joseph was. He was their redeemer of physical things. They needed grain. Then the next one was Moses. Moses, too, appeared to the nation of Israel as their deliverer, but they rejected him. And then he had to come back 40 years later, and then Stephen makes the point that the second time, then they recognized that Moses was indeed the God-sent deliverer, and he led them out. And so he takes them all the way up, and then he tries to culminate his sermon with the fact that this one they crucified was the Christ. All right, then verse 57 of Acts chapter 7. Verse 57, as he comes through the end of this whole dissertation, verse 57, then they, these Jewish leaders in particular, the nation in general, 
<clears throat> they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears. And they ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Here we have now a high point in Israel's rejection of everything pertaining to Jesus of Nazareth, and we're introduced to the next major player on the stage of God's dealing with mankind, Saul of Tarsus. All right, so verse 59. So they stoned Stephen, who was calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. All right, that was Israel's final act of rejection concerning Jesus of Nazareth. All right, then, like I said, we were introduced to the next player on the stage, and that's the Apostle Paul, as we know first as Saul of Tarsus. All right, now I'm not going to rehearse his conversion on the road to Damascus. I think most of you are well acquainted with that. But I want you to come down to see how definitively the Scripture now points out that here is this fork in the road. Up till now, it's been all God dealing with his covenant people. And Peter appeals to them. Stephen appeals to them. But now, after they have rejected him, now God does something totally different. <clears throat> Verse 10. Verse 10 of Acts chapter 9. Saul, of course, is being dealt with just outside the city gate. The Lord has appeared to him. But now the Lord appears to this Jew who was one of the leaders of the synagogue in Damascus. Verse 10, there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Now you always have to remember the word disciple does not always mean like we think of the twelve. A disciple was a follower. And so Ananias was certainly not one of a twelve or anything like that, but he was simply a believer that Jesus was the Messiah. All right, and so he's a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, gets his attention. Now verse 11, And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Now Ananias answers, Lord, I have heard by many of this man, and how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem, persecuting them, putting them in prison, putting them to death if possible. Now verse 15. What's the first word? But. But. The flip side, God's got another side of the coin. But the Lord said, Go thy way, for he, Saul of Tarsus, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the who? Gentiles. Now, I'm not going to take time to do it. I think I did it a few programs back. Do you remember that? When Paul had now been out amongst the Gentiles and had had a lot of converts, he had started little congregations of believers, but he always had that heart for the Jew. And he went back and he appealed to that great Jewish audience. And they listened to him until he said one word. What were the word? Gentile. And when he said Gentile, they just erupted into a mob, threw dust in the air, and said, away with such a fellow. It's not fit that he should live. Well, you see, Saul of Tarsus' mentality was the same thing. They could see nothing good in those pagan, uncircumcised Gentiles. But now the Lord says, I'm going to send you far hence to those Gentiles. Can you imagine how that struck into the heart? of that good Pharisee Jew, Saul of Tarsus. 
But this is what the Lord commanded. And of course, after that experience on the road to Damascus, Saul had no argument. But this is what I want you to see, that here in Acts chapter 9 now, for the first time in the scriptures, here in the New Testament, we've got God showing openly that he's now going to turn to the Gentiles. Unheard of. My, the Jew had no concept of going to the Gentile world. You know, turn back to chapter 8. Chapter 8. Because I know a lot of people, they, they, they can't believe this. They, they think Jesus ministered to Gentiles. No, he did not. Two of them, that's all. And the twelve had no ministry to Gentiles because you remember the verse I read, and I think it was in the last program, that the Lord commanded them they were not to go into the way of a Gentile or into the home of a Samaritan, enter you not. They had nothing to do with Gentiles. But, you see, mankind seems to think that just as soon as you get into the New Testament, God is dealing with Jew and Gentile. No, He is not. He's been dealing with the nation of Israel based on those Old Testament covenants. And if you think the twelve went out preaching the gospel to the whole world, you don't know your Bible. They stuck in Jerusalem. And here is the proof of it. Acts chapter 8, verse 1. Probably seven years after Pentecost. I like to think between seven and eight. And I don't claim that I'm right, but that's where I think it is. All right, verse 1. Acts chapter 8, And Saul consenting unto his, Stephen's, death. <clears throat> and at that time there was a great persecution against the assembly which was at Jerusalem, these Jewish believers, under the persecution of Saul. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Every one of those Jewish believers had to flee for their life except who? The apostles. They don't flee. Their life is endangered. But they're not about to leave Jerusalem. Why? Because Israel is at the hub of the matter. Israel has to be converted. And they're not about to go out into the Gentile world. All right, let me give you another one. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 19. Acts 11, verse 19. This is the verse that first opened my eyes years and years ago. Acts 11, verse 19. And this just says it in plain English. There's no way of twisting it. There's no way of lifting it out of context. It says what it means, and it means what it says. Acts 11, verse 19. <clears throat> now they who were scattered abroad, upon the persecution that arose around Stephen that we just read about. They traveled as far as Phoenix and Cyprus and up to Antioch, preaching the word. Now, you've got to stop there a minute. How much word was in print at that time? Just the Old Testament. That's all. There was no New Testament written yet. And so they went everywhere preaching the Old Testament to none but what? Jew only. Now just look at that. Underline it. Highlight it. They went everywhere in that then-known then vicinity on the eastern end of the Mediterranean, North Africa, up into what is now Turkey. And they were definitely preaching the Old Testament, the record how that Christ had come and that he had been crucified, but they preached to none but Jews. Isn't it funny that people can't see that? They weren't about yet to go to Gentiles, but a sovereign God is in control. And so you get down into the very following verses, my goodness, now what happens? Gentiles are getting interested. Gentiles are showing an interest. By God's sovereign grace, of course. But when the news got back to Jerusalem that Gentiles were getting involved, what do you suppose the Jerusalem leadership thought? Uh-oh, something wrong here. 
You know, I would like to use the analogy I read several years ago where one of our major denominations who are headquartered here in the Midwest heard of a gross heresy being taught in one of their churches down in Alabama or Georgia. Well, what do you suppose the hierarchy up here in the Midwest did? Well, they sent people down there, pronto, to check it out. Are those people really teaching that kind of heresy in one of our churches? Well, that's natural. But see, that's exactly what the Jerusalem leadership did. Gentiles getting interested? Hey, there's something wrong. We're not supposed to be going to Gentile. And so look what happens. Verse 22. Gentiles are just beginning to show an interest as a result of these persecuted Jews. And so, verse 22, tidings of these things came to the ears of the church, or the assembly is a better word, to the assembly which was in Jerusalem, over which Peter and the eleven were more or less holding sway. And they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. Well, for what purpose? To check this out. Do you mean to tell us that those Gentiles are getting interested in the things of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? That's basically what it's saying. All right, but now read on. Verse 23. You know what I always have to stop and say here? Isn't it amazing how God always gets the right man at the right place at the right time? I maintain, had any of that Jerusalem leadership except Barnabas gone up to Antioch, they would have squashed it right then and there. But see, Barnabas was the right man. He was the perfectly right man for that particular time. So verse 23 says it all. So when he, Barnabas, came and had seen the grace of God, how that God in his goodness was reaching down to these pagans, he was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. This is why, because Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith, and much people were being added unto the Lord. They're being saved, Gentiles probably as well as a sprinkling of Jews. And as soon as Barnabas sees what's going on, Again, sovereignly, by God's direct leadership, what does Barnabas do? He goes and looks for Saul. Isn't that amazing? He goes and finds Saul. Now, if you think I'm stretching the point, come back over into chapter 11, verse 1. Chapter 11, verse 1. And this follows Peter going up to the house of Cornelius. And Peter wasn't too hot on that either. But the Lord forced it. And when he saw the evidence of these Gentiles being saved, my Peter was awestruck. They were astonished. They'd never seen anything like this before. All right, now come down into chapter 11, verse 1. And so the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles, the house of Cornelius, had received the word of God. But now don't stop there. Look at verse 2. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, after having been at Cornelius, and when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they who were of the circumcision, that is, the Jerusalem believing assembly, contended with him. Hey, they didn't slap him on the back and say, Hey, Peter, great job. My, and the great how God is using us to go to the gen. Uh-uh, quite the opposite. They contended with him, saying, verse 3, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and horror of horrors, what'd they do? Ate with them ate with them. And you see, the Jerusalem leadership just was baffled. Peter, you of all people, how could you do that? Well, then Peter had to rehearse 
how that God had worked both ends to the middle, worked at Cornelius and worked with him and brought the two together so that Peter could proclaim salvation to that Gentile house. All right, now all this to show then that when Saul of Tarsus was commissioned to go to the Gentile world, hey, this had never been known before. This is something totally, totally different. All right, now then, as a result of that, he is being commissioned there through the, through the word and the deed of Ananias. Now let's come and look at Paul's own words and his own account of it in Galatians chapter 1. Now remember, I'm just trying to reconstruct this great salvation that began with the Lord himself. And I took even back, it began way back when the Lord made the promise of a coming seed of the woman. Gave the promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that through the nation of Israel would come a redeemer. But Israel rejected it all. And God then turns to the Gentile through this man. And now he gives the account of it in Galatians 1, verse 11. Galatians 1, verse 11. But he says, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached of me is not after or does not follow other men. Verse 12, For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it. But where did Paul get it? Not from the twelve, not from any of the Old Testament writings, but he got it from the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, now, when you read Scripture, you've got to keep everything perspective. Where is Christ at this time? Well, he's in glory. He's in glory. And so from that ascended position in glory, he reveals to this apostle, maybe at some point in time he had a face-to-face -face confrontation. I'm not saying he did or he didn't. But he had the revelation from that ascended Lord. And from the ascended Lord, now then, he says in verse 13, You have heard of my conversation in times past in the Jews' religion. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, remember. And how that beyond measure I persecuted that church or that assembly of God, there, that church in Jerusalem, profited in the Jews' religion. But now look at verse 15 when it pleased God. You see what that says? God's sovereign. God's in control of every minute detail. And at the exact right time, not only was Christ born of a woman, as we see in Galatians, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, but Paul says the same thing was part and parcel of his birth. At just the right time, he was born into that Jewish family in Tarsus so that he was ready to be the apostle of the Gentiles at the exact right moment in human history. But you know what? You were the same way. You were born according to God's sovereign timetable. You're not an accident. Every one of us are in that intricate working of a sovereign God. All right, then come on down to verse 16. Why did he commission this man, this good Jew, to reveal his son, the son, the one we've been emphasizing in Hebrews, to reveal his son in me for what? purpose, that I might preach him among the Gentiles or the heathen. And immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither did I go up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me. But he went the opposite direction. Instead of going west to Jerusalem, he went east to, we think, Arabia, Mount Sinai is my own idea. And then after the three years of the revelation of these things of the gospel of the grace of God, then this apostle is ready to go to that Gentile pagan world. All right, now in the couple minutes that we have left, 
I want you to see again. Let's go back to Hebrews. We got to keep checking with home base. Come back to Hebrews again, just for a second. Back to Hebrews chapter 2, still in verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? You'll hear that in your sleep tonight, won't you? How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us, now Paul is including himself, by them that heard him. All right, now let's come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I think these verses just tie all that together. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're going to start at verse 1. I think we've got enough time. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. You ready? Moreover, brethren, he says, I declare unto you the gospel, not a gospel, the gospel, which I preached unto you and which you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, and saved and salvation are synonymous, by which also you have received salvation. That's basically what we can put there. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest you believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all. They had never heard this before. I delivered unto you first of all. That which also I received. How that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. That he was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now resurrection was a tough item for a lot of people to believe. So here comes the proof of the resurrection. And then Paul says he was seen of Cephas, Peter. Then of the rest of the twelve. After that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present. Some have died. After that he was seen of James. And then of all the apostles. See the proof of his resurrection. And then verse 8, and here's where we're going to have to close. Last of all, he was seen of me also as one born before the due time. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.